you hear that fucking, did you see that McAllen has an 81 year old? I saw that today. I Fuck that. me, man. I know, right? We're going to be invited to that tasting, right? <laughs> hey, welcome to Super Social Club. I'm Jeremy. This is Whiskey in the Six. I'm Rob. Welcome to the Whiskey Ramp Podcast. It's a little crusty. It's frustrating. And it's going to be a little bit of a rant. I don't understand it. I don't know why. Some sort of injustice. Anyway, end rant. Hello and welcome back to the Whiskey Ramp Podcast. I'm Jeremy. I'm Rob. And today we're talking independent bottlers with the whiskey market the way it is, the secondary market the way it is. Is the independent bottle market still the best value for Scotch whiskey and other whiskeys? You know, uh, one of our friends, our common friends, uh, James Bourne, who helped me get this bottle right here, which is the Gordon McPhail Klein Leash. Mm -hmm. He thinks that that's, that's pretty much it. Like based on the market and value and that sort of thing. <clears throat> yeah. He thinks that independent bottlers are going to be doing really well in the near future. Yeah, I mean, you see what these whiskeys are going for, secondary, and even just like the availability mm -hmm. of stuff. Like, let's take what we always talk about at Springbank, right? Prices trickling up, yep. you know, demand through the roof, yep. availability, very scarce. Yep. You can go into the independent bottle market, and we talked about it before. You can find distilleries that you really like, and people are bottling this stuff the way that we want it, at cast strength, non-chill filtered, no added color. A lot of times you're getting single cast, which are a little bit vary from the, the characteristic distillery. This makes it really interesting. And the smaller the company, the, the more of a chance, in my opinion, that they're not going to just, like buy up a shitty barrel you know what I mean like it, let's if, if it's you and I starting up an independent bottler tomorrow we only have set amount of cash flow to like buy this barrel we're not gonna buy a barrel that's crap you know what I mean you're not gonna buy it just to bottle it you're gonna buy something that you're putting your name on it yeah and especially if you're just entering the market you got to make a name for yourself exactly. and you got to start out with a bang I mean we can talk about some independent bottlers that seem to have watered down their name mm -hmm. Um, SMWS comes to mind a little SMWS bit. SMWS is a big one that, and we'll I've talk about that. Moved away from. Yeah. But let's say someone's watching this for the very first time; they don't even know what an independent bottler is. What sure. is an independent bottler in the Scotch whiskey world? An independent bottler is basically Rob and Jeremy decide they're gonna open up a company, buy casks or barrels from various distilleries, bring them home, and bottle them themselves, or get them bottled, whatever, with their own label. With so. Example, Dranmore right here is one of the two whiskeys we are drinking tonight. Mm -hmm. um, actually, they're both Dranmore. One is a Ben Nevis, one is an Inch Fat. Um, two different distilleries, same independent bottler, thus same label, meaning the same company decided to buy two different barrels from two different distilleries and bottle it as their own, just giving credit to the name, but essentially selling their own whiskey. Sure. Yeah, and I think a lot of times um, companies will get their own barrels too, and they'll just buy just the distillate from yeah. the distillery. They'll barrel it themselves, they'll age it themselves, and they'll bottle it themselves. Yeah. And it happens in the American spirits world as well. Yep. Uh, we have a couple examples on the table. Yeah, so we got the barrel bourbon here, or sorry, this one is the seagrass, which is a rye, but they have a various like a plethora of different selections coming out of barrel. Yeah, and they do a really good job of doing finishes and stuff like that too. So they're buying distillate from different American distilleries, some Canadian distilleries actually too. There's yeah. some Canadian whiskey in there, isn't there? In this, yeah, there might be in this one. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so Canadian they're buying well. spirit, they're aging it in their own warehouse, they're blending it different ways and then they're bottling it themselves. That's right. And then uh, your buddy over here. Yeah, Smoke Wagon. So they kind of made a name for themselves recently. Um, they're sourcing stuff from Indiana, MGP, which is one of the biggest um, suppliers of American spirits to different independent bottlers in the U.S. Yep. And they made a big name for themselves because they're bottling really good stuff too. And they're aging it in their own warehouses and uh, bottling stuff in batches at, at barrel strength and made uh, a lot of a lot of uh, waves in, in the bourbon uh, community as well. Now... In the American market, it does get a little hazy because there are distilleries that are doing the exact same thing, right? Like they, like Michter's is an example of a distillery that buys, well, for the longest time was bottling MGP. And right. now they're, they're, sort, they're making their own stuff, but they're not quite mature enough to be putting out a 10-year-old, let's say, of their own product or, right. or that kind of stuff. So uh, 
it's especially in the states a way of starting off without having to wait for maturation of your own product sure a lot of distilleries do that right like willet is another example that they've distilled their own stuff but yeah. their older stuff is sourced because they don't even have maturations of whiskeys that are that old yet and some of these companies made their name off of these incredible whiskeys that they source like Absolutely. Willet, for yeah. example right yeah for sure so um, Gordon McPhail is one of the ones that you mentioned earlier, which would buy their own barrels, buy their own casks, source their own sherry butts, their own kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and then put other companies distillate in that. Yeah, they're, um, yeah, they're, the, they're the oldest, the the most successful, probably the largest, most recogn recognizable name um, in one of like one of them in Scotch as a whole, mm -hmm. but definitely in the independent game. Yeah. Yeah, definitely one of the biggest Scotch whiskey independent bottlers. On the table tonight, we have the Carnesier's Choice Klein Leash, which is matured in what, a sherry butt? Yeah. Um, beside it, we have one of the older Kalilas of uh, Gordon McPhail in their Cast Strength series. This is really one that you and I gravitated towards too, because I think that we agree, and a lot of people also mention that Kalila is really bottled really nicely in the independent bottling market. Yeah. Um, so as versus like their core range mm -hmm. of available whiskeys, and we love that stuff. Um, yeah, we we went through a little Kalila phase. Yeah, where we were buying up a lot of Kalila Independent. Yeah, uh, I love it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, beside that, one of the unicorns in my collection, a 1974 distillate, Connoisseur's Choice Ardbeg at 22 years old. Um, this one I traded for a long time ago. Yeah. I traded uh, a George T. Stagg when George T. Stagg was going for about 500 US dollars or so yeah. back in the day <laughs> when it wasn't as crazy as it is now, which is about double that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, really interesting. I really wanted to try it because people talk about 1970s Ardbeg distillers being, you know, that magical kind of time in that distillery. Yeah. Well, let's talk about these two that we're trying tonight, this... Uh... Yeah, so sourced from Malton Grains in Alberta, formerly known as AABC, or ABC as people would call them, okay. uh, from Alberta. Uh, my buddy Rishu sent these to me, I, I purchased them from him. Um, this Ben Nevis over here is eight years old, 53%, and it's finished in first fill white pork cast. Yeah, that's really interesting. White port. Um, I don't believe I've had any whiskey finish in a white port cast. I don't think I've even tried white port before. Yeah. But it gives it this really interesting floral and like potpourri note to it. Yeah. We were saying before, it's almost kind of like what we would know as like an ice wine cask finish. Yeah. Yeah. It's very similar to like some of the single malt ice wine casks that we've had from like you were saying earlier, uh, Glen Breton. Glen Breton Distillery. Uh, yeah. Glen Canadian Ora. Distillery, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it reminds me a lot. Of, back in the day, I did a 12 year old, I believe it was 12 years old, um, Glen Breton, that mm -hmm. was finished in ice wine casks. Yeah. And it reminds me a lot of that. I would say that this one is a little bit more uh, malty. Yeah. Got a little bit more yeast in this one, like that smell mm -hmm. of, the, of the yeast, bready. Yeah, and like this is a really cool thing about the independent bottlers is that you're getting some, you're getting a Ben Nevis, which you know you might not find in a white port cask, yeah, in an official bottling, right? Ben Nevis is hard to come by as a as a like actual distillery bottling, yeah, like an OB, they're not easy to come by. Uh, so when you do see Ben Nevis, it's usually in an independent bottler, uh, and I don't know if that has to do with the fact that they're owned by uh, Nika, aren't they? Yeah. So I wonder if it has any. Or the company that owns Nika. Or the company that owns Nika. Yeah, because you find Ben Nevis sneaking its way into these, you know, quote unquote Japanese whiskeys nowadays. That's right. Yeah. Um, when really they're, you know, they're bringing in Ben Nevis casks into Japan, mm -hmm. blending it with their stuff, and selling it. I really like that. It's, I was I'm pleasantly surprised by this eight year old here. Yeah, it's good. I it's think really good. I, I got it low hundreds for sure. So. Yeah, and both of these are obviously um, natural cast strength, not gel filtered, no added color. No added color, yeah. Um, like you would find in majority of independent bottling uh, expressions. 
What's the ABV of the in inch blad? Also 53. That's 53. It says it on the dot? Yeah. So it does say cast strength, but it also no, says... No, I think we got the boxes mixed up here. Because that one says 54.7. Is that Check that bottle. Because I got this one says 53 on the back. And it might not have. You're right. 54.7 for the each fat. Yeah. Which for it to be 53 on the dot is rare, right? Yeah. So... Yeah, uh, the inch fad is interesting. Yeah, so it definitely has a little bit of peat on it. Um, inch fad is a distillery that I'm not familiar with at all. It's a Highland. Mm -hmm. This is 14 years old. Um, to me, I really get that like Isla style kind of peat note on the on the nose. Anyway. Yeah, you mentioned before we were on camera. Well, I'll let you say it. A note that you pick up on a lot of these. Yeah, so I get like that dinner mint, that crest toothpaste. <laughs> Kind of uh, you know mineral kind of note as well. Yeah, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like that Balchin mixed with like with some sort of like Lafroig kind of peat. Like mm -hmm. it's not quite one or the other. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not quite barbecuey. It's not quite like super iodiney. It's somewhere in between. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know um, where they're. If they're malt, if they're like smoking their own peat, or sorry, um, their, their own, own barley, yeah, and what kind of peat they're using, because it, it does have that very Isla kind of feel to it. Yeah, yeah, this would definitely, I think, be blind guessed as an Isla, in my opinion. Or have they matured this in an Isla cask? Does it say the maturation on here? It's um, it's it just says the finish, which is a first fill PX. First fill PX, okay. Yeah. That could be maybe a factor as well. Maybe it's a, it's like Isla Cask. Yeah, perhaps. true. Like yeah. originally an Isla Cask, then yeah, because it, now that you mentioned that, it kind of reminds me of some of like the Canadian single malts that use an Isla Cask. Yeah, to, it does have that kind of note too. Right. So it could be. Yeah. But yeah, both really good expressions. Um, do you remember what these go for price wise? I believe the in. Inch fad is around 140 ish okay. all in taxes, mm -hmm. um, and I believe this one's around 120 ish. Okay, so we're talking Let's Canadian. We're talking Canadian dollars. Yeah. So like 14 year old cash strength, um, you know that's pretty well priced. Yeah, but considering so. if you're looking at something uh, official bottling, I don't know if I've really seen that many inch fads around, and in, in, they mostly probably. Uh, use their distillate for blends yeah sources. i don't know that much i don't know too much i think it's mostly in the independent mm -hmm. and and uh like you said blends probably um so the the ben nevis is currently 129.90 all in so that's taxes included uh and this one is 149.63 taxes included right. um so i mean what are you getting in Ontario for those prices that's cash strength, unchilled filtered, no added color from Scotland? Yeah, not very much, if any. I can't think of anything. Yeah, I don't know. Right? Uh, cash strength for sure, not not happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's... Although, the, the LCBO gets their one-offs. Like, they got the the Lafroig uh, Karchus cash strength that was... But then again, that's no H statement. But still, low hundreds, yeah. right? They get their one-offs, uh, but while we're on the topic of LCBO, we should rant a little bit about a release that just came out. Mm -hmm. One that we both hunted down and got very lucky with was yeah. the Blue Spot Irish Whiskey what Milton Distillery. A gong show! <laughs> what an absolute joke! <laughs> we're gonna have to bring up the LCBO sucks ticker here because it needs to freaking get a couple ticks on it. We'll decide what how many. We, what were we at last? I don't show. remember. But it's Whatever it be, was, it's how many multiply. Okay, so this is what happened. So the LCBO, <laughs> obviously, you guys know, the way they roll out whiskey is is terrible. Yeah. They don't have anyone, we've said it before, they don't have anyone on the pulse that knows whiskey, that knows that when Blue Spot Irish Whiskey comes out, it's going to be a mad scramble to get it. It was very well priced at 99, Can 99 uh, Canadian dollars, yeah. which for American friends, that's about, what, like 80 bucks US? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. around that? Ish. So less money than it goes for in the U.S. Because yeah. I've heard people pay about ninety to hundred U.S. per bottle for that. I've, I've heard it go as high as um, like 
some shops have it for over three hundred dollars American. Wow, that's yeah. insane. Absurd. Yeah. So the LCBO, um, you can go online, you can check out their inventory, it's all listed. So these started hitting stores and people saw them pop up. And it was about two cases per store throughout the greater Toronto area with no real rhyme or reason of like where it was coming, how many people were getting what, if it was one per customer, if it wasn't. Yeah. It's just a typical LCBO blunder. Yeah. Because they don't know that this whiskey is very sought after. So it was coming up, you know, guys would check the inventory, they'd see a store get a couple things, and they would rush out to get it. That's right. I personally woke up one morning about five minutes too late, yeah. rushed out to Summer Hill, which is the big store here in Toronto. Actually, you know what, now it's the second biggest store because they just opened up one downtown. That's right. Um, and was about a minute or two late and all 12 bottles sold. Luckily, later on that day, I kept refreshing the page and saw that another store at downtown had a case and got there to buy the second last bottle that they had. Wow, second last. So it was insane. Like people were going crazy. Good thing that most stores were doing one per customer. I know one store didn't and someone cleared it out. Um, but that's just the way it is nowadays, right? Yeah. Like if you can clear it out, someone's going to. Of course, because a, it was well priced, so it was a hundred bucks. Yeah, so you're just you're just giving people free money essentially right. at that point. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if majority of that ends up on secondary. It mm -hmm. looks like they're already going for over two hundred, over double mm -hmm. on secondary. Um, just a complete joke of the way they distributed that. It, it made zero sense. Like yeah. it just, I'm I'm still trying to fathom. What happened? Because they had three hundred around three hundred bottles total. Mm -hmm. So around three hundred bottles total. In the right way to do it is one per customer, online only. Yeah. Give all of Ontario a chance to buy this. Yes, yeah, so you, if you're not in the Toronto area, no shot at no. getting this. Maybe Ottawa gets some. Yeah, I'm not Ottawa sure. got a few cases. Okay. Yeah, Ottawa got a few cases. Uh, like Hamilton area got a couple cases, or you know uh, that part of. But it's not, we're sure. talking like with, if you're outside of an hour of the GTA, you better be in Ottawa. Yeah, like my hometown of London, Ontario, they don't see anything. I don't oh, know if not, like yeah. Windsor or Sarnia see any of this stuff. I doubt it. I think Windsor got a case. Okay. Yeah, I think Windsor got a case. It's just, the way it was done, it was completely unfair. Yeah. And, and like, it's just stupid. It was just stupid management. And it's honestly, it's to the point where they would save money. By paying you and I, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and I'm not. I, I I thought this number through. Yeah. They would save, like probably hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, <laughs> like if not more, because you and I have our finger on the pulse. We would be buying exactly what we know will sell mm -hmm. constantly. Yeah. We would like yeah okay you lo you have to like appease certain companies by buying their trash in order to get whatever. Whenever that kind of situation happens, yeah. we, we make little bundles and say, hey, you want that that uh, Blue Spot 7, you gotta buy Red Breast at 40%. Sure. You know what I mean? Just to blow it out, yeah. you know what I mean? And and that's stuff that's readily available and people just walk past. Yeah. But the amount of money the LCBO would make because of us, Trump's whatever salary they end up giving us. Like I, I'm confident that they could pay us up to $500,000 a year each yeah. and still make boatloads of money. Cause like these store managers of the, of different LCBOs, they have to absolutely hate when this happens. Cause they're getting hundreds of phone calls of a day being like, you have this, can you put one aside? Can you like, you know, I'm coming right down, blah, blah, blah. It's like when they get a case of like, you know, Weller 107, they're probably like, oh shit. Like, this sucks. These We're going to get like, with, people lining up. We're going to yeah. get fucking people heckling. These are know. people with families that really, at the end of the day, they don't give a shit about whiskey. And rightly so. That's not that's not why they're there. This is their job. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're It's their nine to five. They do their job. They go home. They shouldn't have to worry about a homie from Rexdale being upset because <laughs> I'm talking about myself here because I'm from Rexdale. <laughs> being upset because... That store didn't get anything. You know what I mean? It's not fair to that guy. Yeah. And it's it just it is what it is. And honestly, I really do believe that they would make whatever their profit margin is now, 
in the whiskey category, we could double it within a year and they could pay us absurd amounts of money and they would still double that yeah. profit margin. I honestly believe that because I just feel like it's, they're leaving it up to people that just don't know better and it's not their fault. They're yeah. not being trained. They, yeah. They're not hobbyists by, like that's not, this is not their hobby. They, mm -hmm. they have a job, it's a government job and it's a decent paying job and yeah. has benefits and whatever else and good for them. But the LCBO could be making so much more money. I don't know if this happens in the wine aspect of it. Like I'm not plugged into the wine world. Same. I know that a lot of people are and they would know for sure. But like, I don't, I'm assuming that it does because I'm sure mm -hmm. the LCBO is a huge buyer of wines. And I'm sure there's very, very rare stuff that comes into the vintage selections that people are in the exact same situation with, Absolutely. right? They're running out, trying to buy it. And they're trying to flip it. Yeah. You know? So I'm really liking this Ben Nevis a yeah, lot. It is good. Wait, I, we have to say how many LCBO sucks points are we throwing up on the ticker? I told you we have to multiply it. We have to multiply it. So the question is, what are we multiplying it by? Because it's a stupid amount. Like, I think it should get like 50 points. Total? Yeah. Let's crank it up. Yeah. Because this is an ongoing thing. Yeah. I just, I think it's just pure stupidity on their part. And... I really do feel for the people that are working, put it this way, our buddy, friend of the show, Paulo, mm -hmm. called Hello LCBO, probably about six days straight. I witnessed this. On our lunch hour, six days straight. He got a different answer each time he called. Absolutely. The questions were, how many bottles of Blue Spot will there be? Yeah. Which stores will be getting them? Mm -hmm. Will it be online? Every single time he called, it was a completely different answer. And then what, finally, someone knew their shit and was like, oh, you know what, I gotta go into a different uh, program for this. Give me a sec. Right. So went into the different program. There's exactly this amount of bottles. It's gonna be popping up on various stores. I can tell you that it can, it's, might pop up at this store because I know that they put in an order for it. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stores that put in orders for it are not getting it. Right. She knew her shit. Yeah. Who the hell were the five people before her that didn't know a single thing about, like, who are they putting in this seat? Like, it's like, it's, I don't know what, what they're looking at on their computer screen, but like some people can see more information than others. It makes no sense. It can't be that. It can't, it can't like, I mean, are, is it, is it literally just because these are disgruntled workers that just don't give a shit and be like, yeah, maybe, you know, what do I say to this guy to get him off the, I mean, the phone I mean, as fast as possible? I know, I know some people that work at the LCBO and they're awesome people, but at the end of the day, they're government employees. Yeah. And, you and they're, have, mis they're, you, they're mistreated. It, they're sure they're mistreated and they don't really care that much. I mean, what's going to happen to them? Nor should they. Nor should they. Why, why should they? Why should they sweat more for a company that doesn't give them much room to move up, doesn't pay them to be trained properly, and then they're left dealing with the heat from all these disgruntled uh, customers because head office just completely botched the whole situation. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, LCBO opened up brand new flagship store uh, right on the harbor front, Cooper Street area. I heard about this that. This is their massive, massive new headquarters. Um, I'll head down there sometime and do a video of the store. What would you leave your job for right now if they said, hey, come take over this store. We want you to head our whiskey program. Oh yeah, I'd do it. No, what's, what's the price tag? Like how much would they pay me? How much would you need to oh, do it? Oh, I mean, I wouldn't need that much. No? No, I don't think so. I mean, I know what they freaking, I know they pay a serious amount of money to their employee. Like even just a regular LCBO employee that just essentially working a retail a job, yeah. right? Yeah. They get, how much do they get paid? 85000 a year? Is it that much? Yeah. That's absurd. They get paid crazy. Like, I don't know if that's what you start at, but I know a lot of people yeah, make I guess, like... Okay, like if you're permanent and you've been there for many, many years, or whatever, that's, that's yeah. a lot of money. You man. make that's... crazy money for doing a retail job. You get all the benefits. Yep. You get all the good, you know, all the good benefits. I think the problem is, and a lot of the LCBO um, workers will attest to this, is that like it takes forever to get permanent there. Mm -hmm. So like they just keep you as part time because they know that they don't have to give you the benefits. They don't have to, or even if they do, it's temporary. Like they don't have to give you pay increases as much. That's like every that. corporation. Though. You're right. Yeah. yeah, that's true. 
That's like every corporation. But I mean, why would I pay someone full time and give them full benefits when I can just hire two people? That's right. And pay them less. Yep. Than and one full timer. That's true. And I know? think that's what they're doing to be yeah. honest with you. But I've met a few guys from the LCBO that are making probably a hundred and fifty plus. Yeah, I think the managers make a serious amount of money. So it is what it is. I don't care about. Listen, I don't. I don't want anybody to lose a dollar from their pay. Mm-hmm. That's not what this is about. This is about. Just be smarter about your thing. And it's going to save you. It comes from the top. It's going to save you headaches. And it's going to save all these store managers have got to be just blowing their heads off with this stuff. Absolutely. It comes from the top. It comes from the high ups that need to know better. And that's it. Like, Mm -hmm. you need to know better. Yeah, you got a cushy job. Fine. Earn it at least a little bit. Do the right thing. Make sure that, like, you know, when these rare bottles come in, you're on top of it. You Mm -hmm. know, like what's coming in and out have somebody that actually cares with their finger on the pulse the interview to get a, like a high-end whiskey <laughs> job in the lcbo should be okay let me hear what your bar looks like i want to know what your bar looks like right now let's start there <laughs> yeah tell me about your favorite distillery and why it's your favorite distillery sure. i should write these stupid questions <laughs> honestly i think they would do way better and then you know this is, this is our resume right here, LCBO. You need to get us on board. I really believe that I got to stop giving away all my great ideas <laughs> because I give away money constantly. <laughs> Just give people ideas. Nobody's listening. <laughs> no one's listening. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, these like random <laughs> bottles are being dropped at like exactly what I asked for from various distilleries. It's like, what? Speaking about a bottle drop, McAllen freaking shocking the world today. With the one with up. An, well, yeah, one up in Gordon McPhail and Glenn Livett with an 81 year old expression. Did you see this freaking decanter they freaking came it's out beautiful. with? We'll throw it up on the screen right here. <laughs> yeah. Um, pretty epic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you think the LCBO is getting a bottle of that? You yeah. might get one. Yeah, they'll get one. Right? They'll get one. Yeah. There's only, what was it, like 200 bottles? Yeah, yeah. something around there. Um, you know, I what, think it came what are they out, charging for that bottle? Yeah, it's not too bad. It's less than you would probably think. I think it's ninety six thousand pounds. I would pay that. You know yeah, what? I would take out. A, would. I would take out a line of credit and pay that. Yeah. And the reason for this is, is, and I wouldn't drink it obviously because I couldn't. I, like, I'm not taking away from my kids' <laughs> uh, future because I decide to crack open a two hundred thousand dollar bottle. But um, that bottle. The moment it sells out, which will be very fast, Mm -hmm. is going to be worth close to a million dollars. Yeah. See, I was going to ask you about this and what you kind of thought that it would go for on secondary. Because if you take a look at McAllen and you take a look at recent auction bottles that have gone for epic money. Right. You look at the 1926 McAllen Fine and Rare, which uh, notoriously sold for like the craziest, like the highest auction price ever, which was, I think... 1.4 1.4 million pounds wow. in 2019. More recently, that same bottle sold for 1 million pounds. So right. someone lost about a half million pounds of value. Yeah. Um, are these hedge funds losing money yet? I mean, it seems like they're buying at crazy prices. Is it going to keep going up? I wonder. Okay, so I want the hedge funds to fucking crash. <laughs> you know what? It's funny because. I compare it to the housing market mm-hmm. in Ontario. It's not far off. Mm-hmm. It's not far off. Like if you look at the way a bottle appreciates now, it's like in some areas, okay? I've I've witnessed in 6 months between a 400 to 600,000 dollar increase in Ontario. Like how does that happen? Yeah. So we're talking about housing right now, obviously. So if if like it translates though to what's happening in whiskey. Like, look at the look at the Springbank ten year old local mm-hmm. barley. That's got to be the fastest skyrocketing bottle I've ever seen in my life, because it retailed for roughly two hundred dollars Canadian, and a good friend of ours is selling them on secondary for like fourteen hundred bucks Canadian. Yeah. Like, that's absurd. I mean, it sounds absurd, but you look at the bourbon secondary and it's just as crazy. Yeah, that's always been crazy. Like, the, the Pappy and BTAC has always been what it is. Yeah. 
and it's getting even more insane. Yeah. Yeah, so this McAllen, um, I mean, you gotta figure that it's gonna be going for crazy secondary value. I don't know, like, if you look at the last, like, super age-dated McAllen that came out, the 72-year-old the 72 72. Lalique, right? Yeah. So that one, you can find that at auction for, you know, a very reasonable 60,000 pounds, 65,000 pounds. Yeah, it's like, it's not, not that bad. It's not too crazy. So yeah, because originally it went for what? 72, $70,000, right? It was like 70 or $80,000. So is it lost money? Well, I'll throw it up here just to be sure that I'm saying that right. Um, well, if it's 60,000 pounds, you're looking at close to double, so call it 110. So they still made 40 grand on their bottle. Yeah. You know what I mean? 40, 50 grand on their bottle. So, I mean, I'm sure if they went to flip it, they're not complaining about 40 grand on a bottle yeah. investment, you know what I mean? But it is interesting that that, that fine and rare 1926 did sell for about half a million pounds less more recently, two years later than... That's got to hurt. Right? That's got to hurt. Yeah. That's got to hurt. But whoever bought that first one was absurd. They're insane. Nobody's well, spending a million dollars on a bottle for Like, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's crazy talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like one like 1. 1.9 million... US dollars. Yeah. And you've lost, you know, <laughs> 600,000 US on that. that. That's a bad market day. Yikes. But hedge funds won't be happy with that one. No. <laughs> the difference is, is you don't, like, why pull this, why let it happen though? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Well, like, I mean, I guess in their eyes, what they bought that bottle for versus what they sold it for, two different things. Yeah. So that was a very, like, interesting cast. You can read up the history of that, that Final Rare 1926, because I think some of the bottles, I think they split up that cast into, like, some very, like, rare kind of, like, let's get an artist to do the bottle, and then the rest of it came out as the regular Fine and Rare label. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I wonder if anyone's even opened that bottle, any, any of those bottles, maybe for a charity I thing. I doubt it. And this yeah. was what I was going to say. The onus is on McAllen. When this bottle comes out officially to open a few to give to people that are buying the bottle because yeah. you can't expect them to open that bottle. Yeah, so let's throw out uh, Cam. He is the McAllen rep for uh, Ontario. Uh, yeah, if you have some spots open for a McAllen 81-year-old tasting, we have experience tasting very old whiskey. We, we, know, we know how to do it. That is true. <laughs> I don't know if we're getting that phone call, to be honest with you, but um, yeah, it would be cool, but I, I don't see it happening. We still have yet to try the McAllen M, or I have yet to try the McAllen M. Yeah. Um, have you tried it? Yes. Well, you tried it at Rohit's. Yeah. Yeah. It's tried it. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the, there's the... The number six. The number six. Mm -hmm. And then there's the uh, reflections. Right. So I've, I've yet to try, I think, any of those three. Did I try the reflections? I can't remember. I'm going to say no. If I can't remember, it's probably no. You know what? Those, you could buy tickets to tastings that included those bottles. Yeah. I've never, I've never actively sought it out because mm -hmm. I knew that I was never going to buy that bottle. And mm -hmm. really, at the end of the day, if anything is going for that kind of money, I believe it should be cash strength. <laughs> yeah. Well, McAllen, you know. And I think they're, they they're 81 year old. Strength. Their 81-year-old's got to be cash right I think so. I think it's 42 or 43% or something. Like yeah, yeah, so. Um, back to these whiskeys a little bit. I'm getting a ton of butterscotch on the Ben Nevis. Like a lot of butterscotch. Like that old school granny, like out of her Where there's original yeah. kind of like, stuff? Not even, like predating Oh, yeah, like, okay. Like the square, like the, really the square hard, cubes? Yeah. Those oh, no. butterscotch cubes? Those are good. Those yeah. like the caramel or whatever they're right, called. Yeah, no, yeah. not caramel. That's the chocolate bar. Right. Those, I know which ones you're talking about, but mm. not those ones. I'm talking like the hard candy, like butterscotch, mm -hmm. but like rounded. Mm. Yeah, I'm really liking both of these whiskeys, and they're they're different than you know scotches that you drink every day, and yeah. it's nice, refreshing, uh, interesting stuff. I know Toronto Whiskey Society is doing their like oddball tasting, which I think they do once a year, whereas it just is these weird independent bottles, right? Yeah. They're just like kind of like different stuff that you've probably never had before in maturations that are like way different. Um, and they're very interesting, and there's very it's very good like educational wise for your palate. Yeah. To try like these weird kind of things, you know? Absolutely, I, I, it's important. 
Yeah. I think it's really important. If you if you want to call yourself a whiskey geek, you need to taste a lot of different types of whiskey. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Um, Do you want to throw a score on these? I wouldn't mind. I mean, I think I think they deserve a score. I think, honestly, the way I handle this kind of stuff is if it if it's lower than an 80, I won't score it. I just won't. I won't score it for the sake of the company that whatever. Uh, I bought these with my own money, but... I still don't like trashing stuff. You know what I mean? I don't like tra- like, And I don't think that scores in the 70s are trashing anything. Maybe maybe it's like, I can't remember the number I originally saw. Yeah, see, we talked about this again. If you score out of 100, something like, whoa, you scored in the 70s is really low. If you score yeah. out of 10, a 7 is a pretty good it's score. It's not so bad, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. What, do, what would you score, uh, the Ben Nevis? So I think I like the Ben Nevis a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's like probably in the mid to high 80s for me. I want to go maybe like and throw like an 86, 87 on it. Mm-hmm. I think 87. I think it's I think it's pretty solid whiskey. Yeah, I'm gonna go 88 on the Ben Nevis. Yeah. I really like it as well. Um, I just think it's these are neck pours. Mm-hmm. I think that's, it's, that's a good point too. Right? We just cracked these. Yeah, I think it's gonna get even better, and I really like. And there's like literally nothing off putting about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's eight years old. It doesn't drink eight years old. It drinks a little bit older. For sure it does. Um, it's 53%. Again, I wouldn't say I need water or it doesn't have no. like too much heat or anything no, like that. No, not at all. Um, it's sweet. It's malty. It's got all kinds of like different things going on. I like it a lot. I think it's an 88. To be honest, I prefer it over the inch flat fad, but I actually really like the inch fad as well. Yeah, so do I. And I think that the... The maturation on the Ben Nevis, that white port is very, very interesting. It's cool. It's, it's different. It's really different. Yeah. And I, I really like it. Yeah. Uh, inch fat for me. I think that this one, I think it's pretty solid whiskey too. I want to go 86 on this one as well. I think it's very good. I love that kind of like Isla spin on it. I, I, this is the very first inch fat I've ever had. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm interested in, in trying more from their distillery. Yeah. I'm going to go 87. I think... Um, I, I agree with you. It's probably drinking more like an 86 tonight, but I feel like even more so than the Ben Nevis, this one's going to completely get better. Yeah. Because you could just tell like there's certain things that like with a little bit of time open will really iron itself out. I think that both of these have a great finish. The finish lasts very, very long on both of them. And I think that's obviously with the, with the cast strength maturation. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that they're very, very good. And this interesting independent bottler. I'm interested to see more stuff. It seems yeah. like they're bottling kind of cool stuff. So it's interesting to see what else they want to come up with in the future. Absolutely. My, my first impressions with both of these mm-hmm. um, tonight is the first impression for both of us. And I would buy them again. I would buy, I would probably, if I could buy this again, that one again, for that price, I think they're worth it. Yeah, I think a cool thing to do with these independent bottlers, because they are kind of like shots in the dark, like what's an inch fad, you know, a lot of people haven't heard of that Absolutely. before, like a Ben Nevis and like a white port, split them with someone, Yeah. you know, go in with the two guys, three guys, buy a couple of bottles, and it's really interesting to try out, and I think that's the way to do independent bottlings, you know, because a lot of times they're single do. cast, right, they're single yeah. cast, you don't really know, yeah. and uh, it's just, it's just whiskey that is different and uh, it's fun to try with people. Yeah, I mean, we used to we we started talking about SMWS a little bit. We used to do that for SMWS. Yeah. We used to split bottles. We had some real gems, mm-hmm. but then there was some like just too many letdowns. Mm-hmm. Too many letdowns. That the one Irish whiskey that we got that time was unbelievable. Yes, it was a Bushmill, I think, a fifteen year old. Uh, pastries and sweet treats. I'll never forget really that one. Really good Irish whiskey. I'll never forget that one. Yeah. If anybody has a bottle of that unopened, <laughs> let me know. I mean, one good thing about the SMWS, what they did, is they would give you the samples of stuff that was coming to your area. You could be able to try it before you bought it, which I thought was great. Mm-hmm. I think for us, it just became like way too much. Like, you, yeah. know, you know, it's like eight samples a month to try to get through. And then, you know, yeah. buying bottles. Like, it seemed like maybe one or two were worthwhile of purchase and the rest were just pretty average whiskeys. Yeah, I wonder what the business plan there is because there's no way, like how many people are buying every single expression? You can't. You can't. There's like, so much. There's I know, so, so much. I know the Scotch Four Dummies love them and they had a ton and the Scotch Test Dummies love them and had a ton but like there's only so much even those guys can drink. Yeah, well you look at Scott from um, Scotch Test Dummies who has 
got a job as a brand ambassador he's, yeah, he's for SNWS now. Yeah. now. Yeah. And he's doing his thing. Um, and I, th- I think that, you know, it, if you want to split a subscription with someone, it's maybe still worthwhile. But for us, we just thought that we were just being saturated with too much average kind of stuff. And to yeah. know what casts are the gems, it's hard to get to know that and then buy it. Because they it's just a single cast. How I many think, bottles? There's like around 300 and then they, they sell out and then you're just you're left out. I think we got to get Scotty on the channel, yeah. Scotty on the rads, mm-hmm. and ask him to change our mind. Yeah. This is a new a new style rant where Scotty <laughs> is gonna change our mind about SMWS. Yeah, and I'll, I'll I'll give him the opportunity. I know he could do it. Out of anybody, I love. I know I SMWS love has amazing. They whiskeys. have casks. They have amazing casks. Whiskeys. Yeah, for sure they do. For sure they do. But the right guidance and maybe mm-hmm. a little bit less saturation. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like pick and choose a little bit more. I don't think you need to put out fifty expressions a month. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah, it seems like they just do too much. Yeah. Right. When you do too much, you know, you're not going to have every single one. It's not going to be great. Yeah. But as far as independent bottlers are concerned, I mean, they see our money a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I've always loved Gordon McPhail. Like, I've yet to have a bad bottle from Gordon McPhail. They seem like they do very consistent bottlings. Of, They're just of always stuff, great. Right. And they've done so well that they were able to buy Ben Romick. They own Ben Romick. Now right. Well. Yeah, and they get a lot of cast from them too. Yeah. This one, which came into Kensington Wine Market, right? Yep. Um, is this a, there's a, this is their selection because it has their name on the label. Um, a 13 year old Klein Leash, 2007 distillate, 56.5 percent ABV. Um, yeah, but like 276 bottles, right? Mm-hmm. So that's it. And it's like you have to take a chance on it. Yep. It's, I mean, it's, it's calculated risk with them, though. But we know from experience that Kensington Wine Market makes very good picks. Yep. They make very good barrel picks. They've been very consistent, mm-hmm. and they've had some complete gems yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Kensington Wine, uh, Andrew doesn't miss. And uh, mm-hmm. he, he's got, a, I think it's Evan or Ethan. Could be wrong, and don't hate me for it, but... Uh, he knows a lot about whiskey as well. Yeah. So Andrew surrounds himself with good whiskey people. He recently brought on Harmony, who I respected from another store, who's also really good as well. Like, we pump KWM, we pump their tires quite a bit. Let's pump them one more time because I just saw they have a boutique whiskey company bottling of another Klein Leash. It looks like an ex bourbon cask. Uh, that just came available, so if you're interested, it's not cheap. I want to say it's around 200 Canadian. Yeah, they had a spring, but uh, that I, really wanted. I know, like boutique, boutique wine company, or sorry, boutique whatever they're called. Um, we've known them through Narby. Yep. To bottle some really epic stuff. Yeah. So. We'll they're see. they're another independent bottler. That's right. We haven't done too many reviews on them though. That's true. Right? I don't think I even own a single bottle from we them. We should probably split something in the near future. They do really good stuff. I know, like, Adelphi does really epic stuff. Jasper's given us some samples of some really good Adelphi yeah, stuff. Some really good been Adelphi very, stuff. very, very nice. Yeah. Um, when? And Carnmore. That's another independent bottler that I've had some really epic stuff from as well. I feel like what needs to happen next is a whiskey rant independent bottler. Hmm. The, but, was that not this episode? No, like, <laughs> we, we, the Whiskey Rant is the independent bottler. Oh, a Whiskey Rant. It's independent. Called, the independent okay. bottler is called the Whiskey Rant. <laughs> I see. We're bottling our own stuff. Yes. 18-year-old. What first? Canadian, maybe. I would say Canadian. Let's go to... <laughs> I, I think we gotta call up two brewers and, and Shelter Point and Shelter see, Point. see if we can get a cask of each. Yeah. And then go from there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the right way to do it. I think we could sell some bottles to the people out there. Somebody's be interested. I think, I think our palettes are, are <laughs> worth some trust. I'm not gonna put the whiskey rant name or anything to subpar. Of course, that's right? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Uh, big thank you to Rishu for sending me these two bottles. Uh, again, I paid for them, but recommending them, you know, kind of like saying, hey. These are not getting a lot of recognition, and this is what this is what the LCBO lacks. Yes, an employee that knows his stuff mm-hmm. and says, "Hey, 
try out these two independent bottles. I think you're gonna like them. I think they kind of fit your like your profile of what like, yeah. what you're looking for. Yeah, the LCBO, although they do bring in some picks here and there, they could do way, way more. Yep. Like a thousand times more. Absolutely. And they should really have someone like, you know, doing that. They could do it multiple they could do once one a week. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Easily. Yeah. Easily. And sell out instantly. Yeah. Yeah, imagine the LCBO was like an industry leader in barrel picks. That they could be that if yeah. they wanted to. They would. They would put a lot. Of, like, a lot of people out of, out of business. What do they care? They sell uh, one point eight million cases of Smirnoff vodka every yeah. year. So what is it? What's the difference? Yeah, they don't right. care. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah. That's it for me, man. All right. Well, that's it for us. Uh, thanks so much for watching, guys. We much appreciate it. If you want to support this uh, podcast, check out our Patreons. You can join for as little as a dollar and get this podcast earlier than everyone else. And then we have lots of other tiers that are really good as well that you get samples from and all that. So I think we should start a whiskey rent independent bottler, either like GoFundMe or <laughs> not maybe maybe not GoFundMe, but or like separate Patreon. Just meant to be for in the past. See, this guy is an entrepreneur. He is always thinking. Gears are always churning. You know. <laughs> I think that's. I think uh, honestly, fan funded, and those who are subscribed or to that specific Patreon mm -hmm. that are like you know, it's got to be an equal amount. Yeah. An equal amount. Um, this is the amount to come in. This is uh, you know, and we can only accept up to let's say. 150 people because uh, you know you never know how much barrel or bottles you get out of one cask right so hypothetically it's like you know 25 bucks to, to fund the whiskey in the six slash sipper social club or better yet sipping in the six sipping in the six or whiskey <laughs> rent independent bottler yeah um, and they, they get first dibs on a bottle. I mean, hey, if you're going to tell me that I can go around and sample a bunch of casks of whiskey and someone's going to bottle something and put our little name on their label, I'm no, all for it. We're not bad guys. Right? We're Other people guys. do it. Right? Other people can do it. I think it. I think it's important. I think that's the <laughs> next step. I think that's the next step. All we, right. we got to show these guys what we're capable of. Stay tuned. Maybe we'll see that coming. That'd be nice. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Really much appreciated. Cheers. Cheers.